Does anyone else like artwork and feudal oppression? Well, today we're talking House Ecaz. We're talking a House Ecaz guide today. We're going to do this through the uh, the literary idea of a hero's journey. House Ecaz are going to be our hero ascending to control of Arrakis. So we're going to start with the call to adventure, right? Why play House Ecaz? Well, you've got a cool feudal theme. You've got squires, you've got knights, you have little villages that sort of um, become sanctuaries that you can go and, and parade through or make them pay you taxes. It's, they're, fun, they're fun little guys. Uh, you've got this this banging uh, hot pink theme. They're, they're good looking, no no doubt about it. Uh, a lot of people like Ikaz because of their end game power, right? Ikaz are a sort of slow to grow and hard to stop kind of faction. Um, they have they're extremely effective at their wing cons, which are typically the dual push of hegemony and uh, governorship politics. You can really easily have a, a, a nigh unstoppable political machine going at the same time as you kind of conquer the world. So if one of those options stalls out, you can fall back on the other one and, and still get a, a solid win. Um, we also like the ECAS because of their unique thoughtful expansion due to their sanctuaries mechanic. You're gonna expand around the world in, um, in special ways. Uh, we'll talk about sanctuaries in a little bit, but it, it requires a little extra thought as well. So you're not just brainlessly painting the whole map your color. You uh, you gotta you gotta plan your expansion carefully. Um, gives you some some extra some food for thought there when you're when you're playing, and it's a it's a unique way of playing. No one else is quite like that. Um, the second step of the hero's journey is the refusal of the call. Right. So why not play Ecaz? Why would you refuse to play? our glorious pink overlords here. Well, Ikaz has one critical Achilles heel, and it is that they get two less recruitment slots than everyone else. Now that might not seem like a lot, but when everyone else makes six new guys, you get in a big battle, everyone else makes six guys and you've got four, they make six more guys, so they've got 12 and you've only got eight. And we're actually going to combine that with some special ECAS tech that incentivizes you to spend twice as much time training your guys. And suddenly it's really, really difficult to rebuild your army, especially anywhere near as fast as your rivals can. So the Achilles heel of the ECAS is low training times, small amount of training slots. It's difficult to replenish your forces. So. You can't lose. You gotta, you gotta do it all with one army, or if you need a second army, it's gonna take a while to do it, and you'll have this long window of vulnerability where people are gonna kick you while you're down. Um, the, other, the other part of why you may not play House Ecaz, they have sort of a slow momentum-based play style. You can't just jump right out in the map like our neighbors, the Fremen, who are really good at that early and mid-game aggression. The ECAS are not. The ECAS need time to cook, right? We gotta sit back. We really would like our full-sized army to fight. We really would like the time to, you know, build some a, a bunch of main base districts and and build out our villages in unique and interesting ways that will maximize our economy. Our economy doesn't have a lot of early game juice. It can do quite quite well after you've got it up and running, but you need time to get it up and running. So that weak early game is really. Um, uh, the again the, the second part of the Achilles heel of playing Ecaz weak early game and slow to rebuild if you've made mistakes or just had bad luck right step three of our hero's journey the supernatural aid that they receive so what's unique to house Ecaz what are the things that make them stand apart from their rivals well Ecaz has a lot of really cool unique mechanics and one of the reasons they're so fun to play um, number one, masterpieces. So the ECAS can make a building called a masterpiece. And a masterpiece com comes in uh, economic, military, and statecraft flavors. They count as two buildings for that color for, with regards to village quirks. And they're not, they don't get destroyed on liberation, and destroying them causes a loss of authority in Landsrad standing. So on one side, you can see the, um, you can kind of fill up lands with them, and then if enemies take those lands, they're kind of junk buildings. They don't do anything for enemies. 
Um, but they take up space, and if the enemy wants to get rid of them, they gotta lose authority in lands red. And that's kind of a little cheeky, kind of fun maneuver to play. But the big benefit is that they count as two buildings for quirks. And we've talked before, but maximizing quirk usage on villages is very important. So for a quick example, you could see down here, I have five economic masterpieces in this village that pays me three solari per economic building. So I have effectively 10 economic buildings, each paying three solari. And then I also have the quirks on this village doubled due to a bonus. And now these five buildings that were extremely cheap to build, it's like 13 or 20 Plascrete to build a masterpiece. They're basically nothing. They have no upkeep cost. Almost all other buildings in the game have an upkeep cost associated with them, either water and or solari. Masterpieces have no upkeep, and they're just making 63 solari. That's the equivalent of, you know, three processing plants in a rare elements region just for a whole bunch of free buildings sitting there. So masterpieces can be really, really economically useful if you can get them to match nicely with the quirks of the village. Um, the other unique thing, the unique uh, district in the base for the ECAS is the Museum of Unbound Arts, which is a really fabulous uh, addition. I recommend you build it probably as the second or third building like every game. Um, this removes the limit of masterpieces in each village. So typically you can only build one of each color masterpiece in a village, but if you build your Museum of Unbound Arts, suddenly you can do that, fill a village all the way up with all the same color masterpieces kind of thing. So that's super useful for maximizing your economy. And also uh, a recent addition um, in the latest patch was masterpieces on the planet all masterpieces on the planet give authority, influence, and manpower um, maximum totals. So if you build one masterpiece, you can hold three more manpower than everyone else in the game. If you build ten masterpieces, you can hold thirty more influence than everyone else in the game. And we like masterpieces. We're strongly incentivized to build them just about everywhere. So you can get higher caps on a lot of these things that nobody else can. You could be sitting on you know, theoretically 600 authority, while everyone's only else could, could cap out at 500 authority, so that, where that could um, supercharge your ability to grab things in the end game because you've just got a higher cap on a lot of this stuff than other people have. Really great, strongly recommend the Museum of Unbound Arts. The other thing that's unique for the ECADs are the sanctuary mechanics, So, like we mentioned earlier. So a sanctuary is if you control all of the land surrounding a, a village, that village becomes a sanctuary. It gets this nice little uh, pink border along its its neutral village. And then what happens is there are no militia. This can never be attacked by anyone else but you. You could still attack this, actually. Um, and the sanctuary provides you a constant income of plus one authority. Authority, that ever so rare resource that powers your expansion in the game. Uh, and there's no limit on the amount of sanctuaries you can make. You can see here, I have one back here, and one here, and one here, and one here. And we're making a ludicrous amount of authority in this game. Uh, so the ECAS, once they get rolling, once they start making their sanctuaries, they get rolling even faster. It's this momentum based thing, right? You take the right territories, and they will power you to take even more territories, kind of thing. And the other nice thing that sanctuaries do is they also provide a bonus to neighboring villages' quirks. So those village quirks that say, you know, and this one is plus 30% agent recruitment speed because it is adjacent to one of my sanctuaries, it's actually two times that. So this is plus 60% agent recruitment speed, a really nice benefit. So you can see this one village in the middle uh, is benefiting everything around them. All of these adjacent ones are getting, getting extra quirks from that. And it stacks too. This village over here is adjacent to two sanctuaries, so it's getting times three quirks to work with. So I can just load this place up with uh, recruitment offices in this case, and they're all making way, way more uh, manpower. So you can see by le leaning even more into uh, tailoring your villages to the quirks and multiplying the quirks by being adjacent to sanctuaries, you can really get to some super, super strong combinations um, of economic resource production and even just sort of general buffs as well. This one here has two quirks for minus 40% building. We can make super, super cheap major buildings. You know, this normally costs a thousand solari, now it costs 360 to build, right? Cool, cool stuff you can do by multiplying your perks 
and then leaning into them as well with masterpieces. So the other nice thing we like are the gardens. So there's a mechanic after you hit 5,000 hegemony on Ikaz, you can turn one of your lands into a garden, and the garden says it gets bonus knowledge production for adjacent sanctuaries, that's really nice, and it gets bonus influence per all uh, local and adjacent masterpieces. Just really solid. This was nerfed down a bit because it was too strong in the past. I think it's still pretty amazingly good. The final thing it does actually is attacking the village costs the attacker a big chunk of Lanzrad and authority. Um, so you can either have this kind of nestled back in your empire adjacent to a bunch of sanctuaries so that you're making lots of extra knowledge and influence, or you can have it kind of forward in your empire at a place that you think enemies might want to attack. Um, it's less likely to get those economic boosts if it's forward in your empire, but it, it serves as a strong deterrent to anyone that wants to attack. No one wants to pay 100 authority before they even get a chance to annex it. You know, that penalty kicks off as soon as you attack the village. So if you attack the village and you lose and you have to leave and you want to come back and you want to attack the village again, you have to pay that penalty again. You have to pay that authority and that lands are outstanding. So... Um, it's really difficult to take, and t do, taking it can kind of ruin someone's political ambitions because Lanzrad standing is, is relatively slow to build up over time. A super cool mechanic, we love gardens. The other cool mechanic for the Ikaz are champions. After you hit uh, 10,000, no, it's 5,000 now. After you hit 5,000 hegemony, you can um, assign a, a unit, a single unit in your army to be a champion. So be being a champion costs a thousand solari, and then it's permanent after you make one unit. Um, and that champion gets lots of extra health, lots of extra power and armor. It cannot be executed in combat by the Sardaukar. Um, can still be assassinated by assassins walking around, so beware of that. But the critical part, every unit from another faction killed in combat with the champion, and the champion himself doesn't have to be the killing blow, just, it just needs to sort of die near him, you gain a hundred hegemony until that champion dies. And this stacks up. You can see this particular champion has six stacks of champion's trophies. So he is making plus 600 hegemony just by existing. If we get in a fight and 10 more guys die in that fight, he will have 16 stacks. Um, nobody else in the game can sort of farm up hegemony like this. You know, hegemony comes from controlling territory, from paying your spice tax, maybe craft workshops if you're lucky but the ECAS can get it just from killing folks. And it doesn't work against neutral villages, it only works against things that are owned by the enemy. It will work against um, militia that are owned by another faction, it just won't work against unowned militia. Super, super powerful champions, we love them. The other strength of the ECAS are their, uh, their, their ability to lock in governorship. And we'll talk about developments and counselors in a little bit, but just a quick shout out to the political art development. It says that any charter currently claimed by ECAS cannot be proposed for vote. So if the ECAS win due governorship, most, um, you have 30 days to get them out of it, right? Just like any other faction. But the ECAS with their political art now say you cannot support this governorship uh, charter to come up again in the future. Um, once the ECAS have it, it cannot be brought for vote again. So the only way to get the ECAS out, you would think, would be to use the loss of rights um, option that comes up that kicks everybody out of all charters. Well, the double whammy here is that Ebo Vip, the new counselor for the ECAS, says you can use Lanzarad immunity on a resolution to become ineligible. And this does, in fact, work against loss of rights, currently at least. I wouldn't be surprised if they changed it because it's wildly powerful, but... Currently, if loss of rights comes up to kick everybody out of their offices, ECAS can just claim immunity to it, and then everybody but ECAS gets kicked out of their offices. So that means if you win governorship and you've got the appropriate counselor and the appropriate tech, you cannot be removed from it, except if someone comes and blows up your base in those 30 days. Uh, it is a rock-solid win condition that is really, really difficult for people to contest. Uh, operations. ECAS got a number of unique operations. The Epic Quest, a military unit, d deals double damage. So your strongest military unit deals double damage in a region. This is always good. It's super cheap, 100 intel. You pop it in the region and likely your knight champion, who is already ludicrously powerful, 
um, does an outrageous amount of damage, will do twice as much outrageous damage. Uh, so it's super good, always use that. The other one is live performance, which is honestly almost never used because it's weird, but you could if you want to. I think it's like 200 uh, intel, 200 money to use. Um, and it applies to all factions, so this even works for enemies, but uh, gains 5 influence upon killing units and loses 5 influence upon units dying or leaving the region. Um, this is pretty cool. You can get a nice boost of influence with it. Uh, if you are about to win a big fight, you know you're about to, to trample over someone and crush a bunch of guys. You could pop this, get a whole bunch of influence. Um, it also makes the enemy lose a bunch of influence, so it could be a nice little political shift. You need to be really careful because the second part, lose influence upon units leaving the region. So if you win a big battle and then you walk out of the region without thinking about it, loses five influence, loses five influence for everybody that walks out of the region. <laughs> I'm not saying I've ever done that, but if you if you play with this a lot, you'll do that. Uh, you'll forget about, you'll win a big battle, you get a bunch of influence, you'll walk away and you'll lose a bunch of influence. You gotta wait for that timer to tick out, uh, finish the performance before you leave that region. It's always kind of funny. The other one is the Alaka Fog. So this one is somewhat contentious. Some people think this is useless, some people think it's too strong, right? So what this does is all non-mechanical units in combat cannot be controlled. So you pop this in a region, you get a nice purple fog, pink fog in the region, and everyone that's not a mechanical unit, not a war banner or like a ship or a drone or something, suddenly, as long as they're fighting, can't be controlled. They just disappear from your uh, military uh, options over here. You can't even click on them or do anything. They go berserk and they fight. Now, why is that good? Well. For the ECAS, we like uh, we like a man fight. We like to just walk our guys in to their guys, and we just stand there and bash at each other. And, and we like that because the ECAS guys are tougher, and they're going to win that kind of bashing fight. We don't like when the enemy micromanages and uses their snipers to kill our our knight champions, or you know, to blow away our supporting units, weakening our knights. Um, we really hate when the enemy focus fires us. So. The fog does a nice job of preventing that kind of focus fire. It does a nice job of preventing people who maybe don't want to fight, you know? If they're kind of hesitant, do I engage, do I not engage, you can kind of jump on them and use the fog and it prevents them from, from falling back maybe to, uh, maybe to better defensive positioning. And you can use it to hold people in place. Uh, in order to uh, stop them from getting somewhere they really want to go. Um, think of uh, you're, you're capping a territory and it's really critical imp critically important that you finish this capture on the territory and the enemy is running guys in to contest it. You can sort of meet them halfway and then hit them with the fog and then they gotta stop and they gotta fight you there instead of running up to contest and stop that capture. There's some fun things you could do with it. Um, one thing to be really aware of is when you use the fog, you know, you lose control of your own army as, the, as well as the enemy losing control of theirs. And that makes you a really nice target for the old family atomics, right? If someone's sitting on a nuclear weapon and there's two armies that are locked in a death battle and no one's able to control their troops to move them away, it is almost too good to resist dropping a nuke on them. Uh, but you can use that to your own benefit as well. You could build nukes and you could tie someone up in combat and then drop a nuke on them with just some of your men, maybe not all of them. I generally wouldn't recommend nuking as ECAS because you like to keep your lands red standing to keep that extra government option open. So usually it's other people nuking you, but still a fun, a fun little thought. Let's step out and look at counselors real quick. So the ECAS counselors I think are a pretty, uh, pretty clear cut choice here. Um, we have... What I, recommend, what I recommend as the only mandatory counselor, Ebo Vip, giving you Landsrad immunity. Again, you know, we talked about it earlier, but you can just say, nope, I don't want that bad council decision to happen to me. Now, it costs you 20 Landsrad standing to do that, but it's totally worthwhile. Um, yeah, and you could do this at just about anything in a Landsrad. It's wildly strong. You also get two standing upon building a masterpiece, which is fine. We're going to be building those, and we like standing, so that's all good. Ebo VIP is mandatory, in my opinion, in the current iteration. For your number two, you got a couple places you could go. I like Sanya Ikaz, who pays you out Solari production for each sanctuary you have, as well as making masterpieces cheaper. Um, 
This is not amazing, but paying out for sanctuaries does give you a bit of an early game boost. Like I said, where the ECAS economy may be lacking, Sanya helps give you a little extra money to get through those lean times until you've got everything booming. Also of note is Rivi Dinari here. Rivi's fine. Military units at max level have no upkeep. That's okay. Um, you do got to get guys up to max level, which is tricky. Or, you know, if you make someone a champion, they automatically become la uh, top level. So your champions are free. It won't cost upkeep. This is not amazing. It, if, it may save you, I don't know, 60-ish Solari a day once you've got your end game death ball built up and you know assuming no one dies the second benefit is much better military units start with one experience level we like that more experience good our units are already good and making them more good is better um, and then we've also got Mesa Ikaz who got a pretty hard nerf in the last patch she used to be one of the more mandatory counselors she does weird stuff now. You can abandon a village to get authority capture cost, and then masterpieces outside of Ikaz territory give minus siege duration to its village, and they're built faster. I think the most um, relevant way to do this, or, or to use her, is to capture the sanctuaries that you want, build masterpieces in them, then abandon them. And those masterpieces reduce the siege duration on the village, which I believe counts as well towards the debuff uh, that they get when you walk into tax or do a military parade in a village. So you could do them faster and more often. And just having more masterpieces on the map, of course, will boost up those those uh, totals to your um, you know your manpower, your authority, your influence, that kind of thing. So you can kind of do stuff with her, but it, it's a lot of extra work that doesn't pay out a ton for you. Pick Ebovip, pick Sanya, or if you want, you can drop Sanya and take Rivi. Enough said. Let's jump back into our game here. Boop, boop, boop. So, the those are the counselors. Those are the reasons to play, or the, the unique parts to Ekaz. They also have a bunch of unique tech, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's talk about the next step on our hero's journey is the, the Guardians of the Threshold. Who's, who or what is going to try and stop Ekaz from being all that they can be? Well, the things that we worry about when we're Ekaz are early aggression. We don't like small-scale small battles, you know, little uh, skirmishes at the front. Ekaz really like a big, fully-sauced army working together. Um, that can benefit from a lot of stacking buffs for being close to each other, being under um, the, the power of your war banners and your monument. This is the the ultimate expression of Ekaz power. If you have to fight with just like two squires or two musketeers, it's real easy to get outmatched by you know the likes of the Fremen or other factions that have better early game fighting units. We don't like early aggression, or we don't like small scale battles. We like big titanic clashes. What else don't we like? What do we worry about? We don't like assassins. We don't like assassinations coming in on us. Because of our expansion, we're likely to have a long kind of snaky empire that can be very spread out. Also because the sanctuaries will, will push us to be having a more slightly spread out empire. If someone's trying to assassinate us, we just have a lot of territory we need to to search through, right? We've got a we got to do a cell search up here. We've got to do a cell search over here and down here, and then like another one up here. Uh, we, you you just need to do so many cell searches to be able to cover your territory to be certain that you've gotten them all. Um, it's real easy for someone to to have a sneaky assassination cell somewhere where they're still able to to get an, a last minute assassin in and finish you off, kind of thing. So assassination a little tough to deal with as ECAS sometimes, so we don't like that. Uh, put extra guys in counterintelligence. <laughs> Uh, what else do we worry about? We don't we don't like lack of space. We hate it. We hate being boxed in by our neighbors, right? We've got this amazing authority generation. We really want the empty space to be able to expand and keep expanding as much as possible. So neighbors that come and crowd our borders, we might need to to fight with sooner rather than later because we want that living room, that space for our people. Um, we also are wary about the death spiral. So what's the death spiral? So the death spiral is you lose all your men in a fight, you know, God forbid a worm eats them or something, or you just, you just, you're ground down over a battle over a period of time, you make some critical strategic blunder, your army's all dead, you've got to remake them from scratch. Oh boy, that's going to take a while. 
remaking your army is, uh, like I said, a slow process, and if they're continuing to press you, the danger is that you make four or eight guys, not your full army, and maybe you need to use them to try to defend something critical, and they die as well, right? You haven't, you didn't get up to that critical mass to fight, and you, you lose your, your half-strength army, and you're back down in the pits again, and you gotta make more units. Or maybe, God forbid, you get admin burdened in your base, and it is now 80% more to, uh, where's, where's our admin burden here? Is now 80% slower to train military units for the duration of that. Um, you can just get stuck without the ability to rebuild your army for a long, long period of time. And often that's at the most critical point in the game, right? When people are coming to bash your head in. That is a tough, tough situation to be in. And there's not a ton of ways around that. That, like I said earlier, that is the Achilles heel, the weakness of the ECAS. Uh, what else do we worry about? We worry about uh, being Icarus. We worry about flying too close to the sun. Because the Ikaz are so dominant in their ability to gain uh, hegemony, just through expansion even, um, even if you're not using knights to farm people for hedge, the, the, the possibility of you doing so is frightening to other players. Likewise, your strength in the Landsraad Council, it's really easy to get a lot of standing, it's really easy to be um, available to these offices, and if, people, if other people know the Ikaz, they know that it'll be, hard, it'll be impossible to get them out of offices once they're in it. So all of these things make your neighbors jealous and covetous and angry, and they may all just band together to kill you which is a real problem and not necessarily something we have an answer for. Um, you do have the benefit of your defensive army with champion or champions will continue to make you hegemony if you win fights. You know, if, if, it, if the, the lobby is 3v1 coming to kill you, you might be able to win just by defending yourself thanks to getting the hedge from winning fights. So, that, so that's nice, but it's still a danger. Um, and the last danger that we're going to talk about that you need to be aware of, of is the absolute devastating nature of worm strikes or running out of supplies as the Eek has. Like we've harped on before, losing men is bad and nothing loses you men quite as fast as a worm coming up and eating a big chunk of them. Especially if it's your hero or your champions. Um, especially if they're sitting at a bunch of hedge, that worm comes up and eats your hege hegemony and then, then you know, swims away through the sand, <laughs> crawls away, whatever the worms do. Uh, we got to be real careful about worm strikes, and likewise, if we're being aggressive, we got to be real careful about running out of water. Your army may be the best army in the world, but if they all get thirsty and die, um, it's pretty, pretty bad. So the next step on our hero's journey is undergoing tests. So what are the tests for the ECAS? Well, the test is how do we maximize all of these benefits together to make the most of them? So like we talked earlier, really maximizing the, the ECAS economy is utilizing masterpieces to their full benefit. So you love, um, you love any quirks that pay out for buildings of a particular type. You, you love things that pay out when it says, you know, at least one building of each type. Sometimes those can be awkward to reach, you know, it says make one yellow, one red, one blue. Maybe you don't want a red in this territory. Well, you can just build a, mas build a red masterpiece. That'll hit your, hit your trait type there. It doesn't cost you anything. It's super cheap to build, doesn't have any upkeep, and can let you hit those kind of traits really easily. Masterpieces are really, really flexible. Use them, build them everywhere. We want as many as we can get. And that's one of the ways we maximize our economy. Another interesting thought is the use of the Harvester Works is really valuable on the ECAS. So the Harvester Works is a main based yellow district that says plus 5% gather rate per economy building in the village. Well, what counts as double economy buildings are yellow masterpieces here. Um, you can very, very reasonably have all of your spice villages be just a refinery and four yellow masterpieces. And those yellow masterpieces are then paying out an additional 40% uh, to your harvesting gather rate. So you can really make a large, large amount of, of spice. Um, the, uh, I lost my train of thought for a second. Um, main base buildings, let's go back to the main base here for a second. Uh, ECAS are sort of unique in that they have two um, th triple slots for districts in their main base. So you can get the, the level three bonuses of two different things, which is really, really nice. I would always go triple blue and triple red. 
like I said, in this guide, we like to be pressing both politics and we like to be pressing hegemony simultaneously. Um, the trouble is you want a bunch of other stuff too that is then tricky to fit in. You always start with your administrative hall for authority production. Your second building should probably be either the embassy for extra lands rad standing or the Museum of Unbound Arts if you've got places that you're ready to start um, building multiples of masterpieces in. We really like the harvesting works because of you know the benefits we get from economic buildings on our spice fields. You could live without this if you don't have a lot of spice to work with. Sometimes you could just be making your money off of quirks in the villages and not as and maybe you've only got two spice fields. This might not be uh, worthwhile. You love the chome branch for just about everyone. It allows you to play the chome market much more effectively. That's really, really tempting to have. Um, water uh, is you want to live without getting the water if at all possible. The Mason's Guild actually quite good as well because you will have a lot of villages that are fully built out and that will pay you out extra money. If I was leaning towards a chome type victory, um, I would absolutely build a Mason's Guild that's super useful. The other thing we like to be aware of is the research center. Research centers are great to build early on to give you that extra boost for knowledge and hegemony. And then later on, if it gets dangerous, you could get, you could get rid of your research center to drop your hegemony down a little bit. Um, the other one of note, intelligence agency is good, but not something that we're going to lean into too much. We are not too much of an operation kind of faction. We do love the Lanzarad quarters, right? Anything that gives us more maximum influence is giving us more power to take the, to win those tough Lanzarad votes, like maybe the governor that wins you the game, right? Making cheaper, cheaper cost to support a priority is just a little, a little special sauce on top. Um, Command post, a mandatory for every faction. Uh, military academy, obviously mandatory for the ECAS as it gives you two more training slots. So you move from two to four. <laughs> um, Non-negotiable, you have to get a military academy. The last one you could think about a little bit. I like the barracks, but um, recruitment center is very good. Fusion plant is useful if you can't, uh, you can't get the cells that you need in order to get um, all of your mechanical units out. You really, really do want your flying flagship. You really, really do want one or two war banners as well. Let's go on though. So that's, we maximize our economy by building our masterpieces, by taking advantage of the traits, by um, using our harvester works to juice up our spice harvesters and start pulling in huge amounts of spice. Uh, we maximize our main base by really focusing on getting these things built out. Uh, you know, you should always be building a main base building at all times during the, so the early mid game. Um, you shouldn't have long periods of time where you're not building a main base building. Make sure you are prioritizing this. Um, also of note, the ECAS are a pretty Plazcrete hungry faction. Because you are going to be expanding and taking a lot of terrain, because you are going to have to be building so much in your main base, you're going to want to be building out the, as many masterpieces in the full five, five slots as possible. You need a ton of Plazcrete. So lean a little extra into your Plazcrete than you might for other factions, and it'll, it'll help keep that early tempo of building up for you. Um, you should also, we sort of mentioned earlier, but the sanctuaries have an ability to raid them or to tax them. So you can walk into a sanctuary. A sanctuary gives you three options. You can annex it for maybe you want to just turn this into part of your empire to start using it. Maybe you want to make annex this to um, add the hegemony to your end game push for, for hedge. That's really useful. You could tax it where you just get paid out a flat 300 solari and then um, you get a cooldown on it. Boom, boom, boom. It goes super fast. You get $300. It gets a cooldown. No matter what you do, the village gets a cooldown for 30 days, meaning you can't come back and do something to it again. Uh, be aware of the cooldown there is... Uh, uh, you know, shared with even the, the Annex. So if you wanted to take this at the end of the game to get uh, hegemony, you can't if you just taxed it within 30 days ago. So don't tax before you're going to try and take something for the extra hedge. The last option is the military parade, which pays you 20 influence and 20 XP for all of the military units that are in there. This is your as, as a better end game option. Um, influence is really valuable, and uh, XP applies to everyone in there. So if you have if we have our whole army up here, everyone in the army gets XP for doing this military parade. And again, we like our we like our really great units to be even greater. 
So we, we at the end of the game, we tend to do a lot more military parades rather than taxation. Hopefully your, your, tax, your economy is sorted out by then. But not always. You still probably want to be doing some taxing here and there. Um, chapter 6, Challenges and Temptations. You know, what are the hard decisions that the ECA has got to make? We could crush these little rebels here with our, with our, our super army here. No problem at all. Uh, what are the hard decisions we've got to make? What developments to take? Let's talk developments. We've been hinting at it all game. Let's get there. Um, the unique developments that the ECAS have, some good, some forgettable. Um, artistic aspirations, super important. We like this early on. It pays us out money for building a masterpiece, which is great. And it makes the critically 50% cheaper to add a building slot, right? This is the opening your third building slot costs you, what, like 100 Plascrete or 50 Plascrete? Well, it's half of that. Opening your last building slot costs you 400 Plascrete. Well, if you've got artistic aspirations, it only costs you 200 Plascrete. It's a huge reduction in the amount of Plascrete that you'll end up spending over the game, especially because you'll have so many villages building so many things. Artistic Aspirations is probably the, I don't know, fourth or fifth tech that you want. You want it pretty early before you start opening up those extra building slots. It's great. Cultural Tourism pays you out for each sanctuary you have. Not a big deal, you know. Um, if you've got a lot of sanctuaries, it's a bit of money, but it's not something that we worry about prioritizing. Political Art, that one that makes you not able to lose uh, charters, is critically important but you know if you think about it we don't really need it for most of the game um you don't start winning charters till sort of later on and you don't start winning charters that you really don't want to lose until really the very end so you, you can kind of save political art for one of the one of the last things you get but don't forget to get it if you're about to grab a, a charter that's really important influential plots over here is the the assassination tech for the ecas um We'll, we'll talk about assassination in a little bit, but generally we don't like assassinating too much as the Eek has. Cosmopolitan elegance is pretty forgetful, forgettable. Um, agents, uh, information levels rise and fall faster. Agents produce max at max information level produce plus 50% of every resource. It's a pretty negligible amount. Manichean propaganda is interesting. Extra militia, and if the militia die, the enemy loses influence. It's kind of cheeky, kind of fun, but it's not a big deal. I mean, you could do it if you want a little extra defensive power and you're climbing up higher. Prideful Crown is a really interesting one. It says villages at a distance of two and exactly two, not up to two, exactly two uh, spaces away from your garden get cheaper authority to annex and have super buffed up militia strength and health. Um, that's cool. Uh, then there's, there's interesting ways to use it. I would say generally it's not that important. Um, if you if you wanted to lean into it, you could build your your garden two regions away from stuff you wanted to really take later on, maybe, and it will make them cheaper to annex. Or you could build it two regions away from you know your front lines, and you will have your super buff militia. But it's not uh, not a priority. I wouldn't beeline for this under any circumstances. But if you if you're overflowing on the knowledge, you can come get it. It's a lot of fun. Native Artists is critical. It unlocks uh, the Museum of Unbound Arts, which is all we particularly care about. Then, over in the military tree, uh, your national mythos unlocks your war banner, which is good, and you should be aware that the fusion plant for them is the third one down, not the second one down. So if you end up needing a fusion plant to, to pad out your, your red districts in your base or to get that those extra fusion cells, it's this third one down a little deeper. We don't care about manpower's or war banners producing manpower or non-mechanical units regenerating faster that's no big deal but unlocking the fusion plant sometimes is very useful and this third tree we always get with everyone is the only critical tech in the whole game because it gives us command points notably though we do have the option here um not the option just the benefit if uh, I was looking at this one here. When a champion dies, so if you get the, that catastrophic state of, you know, your army has been wiped out, as long as a champion died, you've got plus 50% recruitment speed for 10 days, which is a nice little benefit to trying to get your army back online. Um, it's a little painful, though, if your champion doesn't die. <laughs> if your champion survives and you still need to rebuild an army, uh, well, it's going to take a long time. Um, and the last thing, and one of the most important things, actually, we're, that we're going to talk about is martial perfectionism. So you you can choose to pay 50% of a unit's cost, 50% in addition to the unit's cost, to 
train a unit 100% slower and then give them permanently 20 health and 20 power. So it doubles the time to train a unit and that costs 50% more, probably manpower um, or Solari if it's a knight. But that unit comes out with this permanent 20% buff to health and power. This is really, really good. 20% health and power is, is a huge buff, right? Um, but it, it, slow, it slows our training times from three days to make a squire suddenly becomes six days. You know, I think all of our guys are three days. War banners are five, all of the rest of the units are three. So if you want a perfected war banner, it's going to cost you 10 days to make that bad boy. That's, you know, that's a long time. That's a long, long time. Trust me. But we do still really, really love the perfected units. So whenever possible, we do want to make perfected units. And in fact, if we're sitting at our camp, we want to come back into our army here. If we don't expect trouble anytime soon, we want to look for anybody who maybe doesn't have their perfected buff. This musketeer's perfected. He's got 135 and 504. This musketeer is not perfected. He's got 113 and 420. So you can come back in here. You could find your... Um, we gotta finish this fight actually to disband anybody. You can find your non-perfected units um, that you needed to sort of get through the game, but they're not you're gonna be your end game army. You can disband them and make a new perfected version of them over time. If you've got the time and the resources to do so, I recommend you lean into a fully perfected army if at all possible. Even at the expense of losing someone with a lot of extra XP, you know, if they're fully vetted out, it still makes sense to get rid of and make a perfected unit. Perfection, perfected units are just that good. So what's our what's our tech path? Early in the game, it doesn't matter too much. Composite materials, intelligence network, local dialect studies. Um, nothing is really critical for us early on. A lay of the land early is nice. Pays out a lot of extra knowledge per controlled villages, and we'll be pay taking a lot of villages. We really like diplomatic maneuvers sooner rather than later to get the extra house gifts. And then we like that artistic aspirations to make our... Uh, Plaskrete expansion much cheaper. Apart from that, you can kind of do whatever you want. It doesn't matter as much for the ECAS. They don't have that critical must-have tech. Eventually, you want this third column of extra CP for your army by month three or four. Um, if you're doing a lot, a lot of fast expansion, um, oh, you do want the native artists very early as well to unlock that Museum of Unbound Arts. And then you go up to Outpost Logistics if you want a lot of fast expansion. As the game gets on, again, sort of month four or five, you would like to get your way up to countermeasures to give you that um, extra agent and counterintelligence to protect you from those dangerous assassins like we talked about. We also really love the benefit of countermeasures of getting Lanzrad guards for influence spent. We are going to be an influence-heavy faction, so we like to have extra free guards. That's great. We're going to spend influence on stuff all the time, so having a bunch of extra free units that don't count towards our CP cap, super useful. And of course, finally, political art, critical for that uh, governmental end game, but we don't need it until we're at that end game. So you can kind of you could kind of go up to countermeasures, and you don't even need to go into Landsrad support and political art necessarily until you're really trying to push that end. Landsrad support's really good as well. Obviously, it pushes up your max influence cap for agents on Landsrad information. And we like agents on Landsrad information as well because it's one of the main ways to get a good influence production. Whew, all right, what have we got left? We've, got, we've done a lot here, we've got a little bit more. Um, let's talk sieges. Um, there's not a lot of sieges that we care about. You know, sieges is good. You know, they never do bad things to you, so we like to find sieges and trade with them and get their special stuff if possible. The penalty that we have here is we don't have a lot of agents to work with. ECAS don't have the tech that gives them more than 10 agents. So anytime we can get extra agents, we love that. If we get a Benny Gesserit, if we get like a Fremen sibling, or, or um, it's really valuable to win the eyes of the council for two extra agents, because we're maxed out at 10, anytime we can get more than 10 is good. And being maxed out at 10, it can sometimes be tough to find extra agents to send as emissaries to ally with sieges. So we typically don't do too much of that as the ECAS. You know, we are going to be stretched thin with agents on counterintelligence to keep ourselves from getting murdered, and then just agents on Arrakis, you know, to keep the expansion going, and Landsrad to keep the government going. We don't got a lot to work with, so it's tough to put them in sieges. One special note, though, the lovely change to training grounds for sieges of 30% reduced unit recruitment time. This is really nice for the ECADs. It practically nullifies the penalty that we suffer from having two less recruitment slots if they go 30% faster. 
Strong recommend always take training grounds if you can get a hold of it or make it an emphasis. You know, if you see it out on the map, maybe you want to go and fight that guy and take the training grounds from him because it really just shores up your weaknesses really nicely. Um, hmm, where are we? Priorities on buildings. Like I said, we need extra plascrete. And then because we are going to be a, uh, because we're going to be a, a political faction, you really want to take your, your edge territories and emphasize listening posts in them. Um, because of that extra influence reduction allowing you to to play politics right it's really one of the one of the few ways that um, you can you can buff up your your influence gain is just having a lot of influence posts around and because we're such fast expansion expanders we are likely to have a lot of neighboring territory with people it's totally fine even to sacrifice your economy a bit you know don't have that extra masterpiece there um, but do build extra listening posts along the border be aware that that penalty for destroying uh, masterpieces affects you as well. I'm at 463 lands red. If I destroy one, boom, I drop down to 450 lands red. Yep. So if you if you haven't planned properly and you need to get rid of your own masterpieces to make space for things, um, you will pay the penalty for that. So think ahead. Um, is assassination worth it? So we talked about it a little bit. It's tough to assassinate with ECAS as well. Just as they are sort of vulnerable to it, it's hard to come up with the extra agents to put on other people and send out to assassinate. And I would not recommend you do so. It's got a, a pretty large op opportunity cost associated with it. It is nice if your neighbor dies because you can suddenly ex keep expanding that way and take everything they've got. So it's not off the table, but because of the tightness of our um, our agent count, because we're using a lot of our border slots probably to emphasize listening posts and not necessarily the data centers for intel, and we don't get any any sort of extra bonus making intel, it can be real tough to assassinate with ECAS. So that is not necessarily something you want to you wanna lean into unless it seems like it's going to be really unexpected and you're in a weird spot. You can do it, but it's it's not the best. Um, chapter seven in our journey uh, with of the hero of Ikaz, apotheosis, you know, ascending to immortality, and immortality with Ikaz means the death ball of units. So let's talk units here. What do the Ikaz have? What makes them good? So your base unit, the Squire, is just a tough, tanky boy. He can't do a whole lot other than not die, but that's cool. That's all we want from him. Your range unit, the Musketeers, are actually really good. They got buffed up a bit, and they're pretty solid. Um, they also count as a, a, like a, an armor-penetrating demolisher unit, which is really cool. They ignore half of the enemy's armor. They have a very slow attack speed, but a very high power. So they're slow, hard-hitting shooting units. But the, the, real, the, the wonderful part about them is they're only 3 CP to maintain. So we usually like lots of Musketeers. And in fights, we'd like to select all of our Musketeers and focus fire down single targets with them. The other unit, the critical unit of the composition, the knight. Um, whereas your squires are meant to not die, your knights are meant to make everything else die. Knights have a massive amount of attack damage. They have relatively low health. Um, do I have a regular knight here? I guess this is a regular knight. At least he's... No, that's a champion. Here, here's a regular knight. Nope, that's not... Here's a regular knight. So this knight, who is already leveled up to two and has a ton of buffs on him, only has 400 hit points, with the squire next to him is sitting at 729, right? So knights have very low hit points, and they try to make up for that by having this bonus of plus armor per, per ECAS units in short range. And if you mouse over the short range, you can see it pops up a little circle to tell you what that is. So if your knight's out here by himself out in the desert, he's got two armor and 400 health, and he's gonna die. If your knight is standing here in the middle of your death ball of units, he's got 13 armor and he is not going to die, right? So it's really important that we keep a tightly packed ball of units together to go and fight. Um, whoop, we got, let's get out of that. We don't care about that lands raid council. Um, the, uh, 
The other thing we've got working in our favor here are war banners, which are our mechanical unit. War banners used to be a staple of the army in old patches, but they got um, toned down a bit, and they're no longer the super strong fighty, tanky units they once were. They're really just the buffers now. Every every um, non-mechanical unit around a war banner in a pretty big radius gets 20% extra damage. You know, needless to say, 20% damage is great. We often will take two war banners just to make sure one doesn't get sniped out easily. We want to maintain that buff across the whole army. We also have the monument, which does basically no damage at all. It has very, very limited uh, offensive capabilities, but has this huge circle of pink music playing. And the pink music, the war anthem, gives all of your non-mechanical units under it plus 30% damage. So yes, indeed, the 30% from that, the 20% from your war banners, all of your guys just do 50% more damage when you're stacked up on this death ball, which is an outrageous amount of damage. Um, that continues to stack with the, the likes of the epic quest, making your strongest unit do 100% more damage. So the way the ECAS army really works is you you want to kind of grab your squires, make sure your squires are out front, make sure your musketeers are in the back, make sure your knights are in the middle. You want the enemy attacking your squires, then you want your knights to engage and just be chonking guys down with their huge, huge hits, and you want your your um, musketeers to stay kind of close to the action because you still want them buffing the knights, but you want them also focus firing stuff down. You don't even really need to use the knights to focus fire. You could let them hit whatever they want and they'll just be killing stuff. And just the fact that all these guys are close together, sharing all kinds of buffs, you're gonna be able to smash through just about any army. What do you, you know, you worry a little bit about people that can uh, focus fire, right? You don't like a big ball of snipers. You'll wreck them, you'll kill them all, but they might, they might look at your army and pick out a champion or two if they get a chance to. Oh my god, we haven't talked heroes. Let's talk heroes real quick. We go with more blood for the heroes, um, and we do that because of his outrageous ability uh, to be a second champ, to be a third champion and name a second champion as well. So Our Whitmore Blood is a champion, he can do those trophy taking of getting you hegemony. He allows you to grab someone else and make another champion, so you'll have a knight champion. You can either make a squire, which is very tanky, I tend to make a musketeer, um, which helps both with damage, and musketeers are still hard for the enemy to get back and kill. Um, so I like Whitmore, a knight, and a musketeer champion. Three champions do just what you might fear they can do. They get three times as much hegemony every time they kill an enemy unit, right? If I walk this army in to my neighbor and I kill his three militia in this village, I just got 900 hegemony. That's, you know, taking a whole nother region and a half of, of hedge. And that, that would just be from killing the militia. That's not even fighting their army. If they come and they fight me with 10 units and I kill all 10 of their units, I just got 3,000 hegemony from that, right? It's an outrageous amount. I wouldn't be surprised if this even gets removed or changed somehow in the future. But right now, the the ECAS army, the triple champion, can farm hedge like nobody else, right? You can, you can boost up to a win super, super fast when no one's ready. Or if you're approaching the win, they have to threaten throwing the entire game by fighting your army, right? If they come and fight you and they don't win, they just gave you even more hegemony, right? So it's awesome. It's the way, it's the reason to play ECAS because the triple champion is so, so good. The other hero, Alessa, um, we're not even going to talk about. She's cool. She's very good. If Whitmore wasn't around, she would be awesome. Alessa gives you really, really strong defensive bonuses, supercharging your army when you're fighting near and adjacent to masterpieces, making them way, way tougher which is very cool. Um, I recommend you play with her uh, for fun, but if you really want success, you use Whitmore here. He's so good. Um, okay, so we talked about our army and how we use it. We talked about farming hedge and just sort of the nature of the scaling power of Ekaz's army. We've mentioned it many times before, but because you're going to have this big army that will scale up in power over game over the game. Oh, also Whitmore as part of the scaling, Whitmore says every champion that gets a trophy gets plus 1% max health. So the better your champions do, the harder they are to kill. It's amazing. It's hard. It's, you know, 1% is not a ton, so you need to be really successful to, to be getting leaning into the benefits for it. But it's absolutely possible to have like an end game knight champion with a thousand health that hits for two, like 150 damage. You know, it, it's, it's crazy. They're so fun. 
Um, so we want to lean into the power of the end game army, and we can do that two ways, right? You can do that either defensively, if you are pushing for a governor win, you use your army defensively, you want the enemy to come into you, use your missile turrets to help defend your land, use your military bases to help uh, keep your keep your army alive, and then the the threat of the army, the defensive army farming hedge hopefully keeps people away, or allows you to push towards that second win condition. If you're going to be uh, aggressively going out and farming for hegemony, you want to do it against the weakest player, right? Because you don't want to lose your army. If the Harkonnens are doing really well and they're, they're you and the Harkonnens are fighting for win conditions and maybe the Fremen aren't doing well, go beat up the Fremen, right? They're, you know, it's free hegemony, free real estate. You know, if you can... Even if they don't even want to fight you, you can just do a little a little pillaging parade. Come, you know, kill those militia, pillage this land, kill those militia, pillage this land, kill those militia, pillage this land. You just got 3,000 Solari and made 3,000 hegemony doing it, right? You want to pick on the the weaker guys as as the knights. This is the knight's way, the knight's code. <laughs> Okay, the final step of our hero's journey, we return home with a mastery of two worlds. We've balanced the material and the spiritual. The end game of the Ikaz, like we've already been talking about, the end game is hegemony and governorship. You know, we push governorship by finding ways to increase our lands red standing. That usually means non-aggression packs with other players. It usually means, um, you can see the... The Intelligence Network says if you get the chosen result on a resolution, you gain 10, 10 lands red standing. So try to make sure you're always winning or, you know, making sure a, a, a resolution succeeds each time a, a Congress comes up. Because you really, really want your lands red standing pushed high as fast as possible. Um, because the lands red standing opens up the ability to get the charters. Um, and you only need one charter in 450 standing and you're suddenly um, able eligible for governorship it is absolutely possible to push a fast governorship in the game before people are ready because of that we really like our triple blue in our base which gives us the hundred votes and then we really like as many uh, listing posts on the border as possible to buff up our influence gain we want to have a huge bank of influence then have a big vote come up and just be able to, to out-muscle everyone else. So things to, things to think about and things to look at. Fremen are not a strong political faction, neither are smugglers early in the game. Harkonnen is also usually not a strong political faction. The ones to look out for are maybe Carino, maybe Atreides, even Vernia sometimes can pull out a lot of votes there. So if you've got a game with more of the less political factions like Smugglers and Fremen or Harkonnen, then you want to lean a little bit more into pushing for uh, you know, your, your political victory. If you've got the Atreides and the Carino around, they will probably be able to band together and stifle any pushes on the governorship. So you might need to get tricky, you know, you call, you make Speaker of the Council come up and you make people think you're going to get that. And so maybe they dump all their influence into stopping that from happening. But really, you save all your own so that you can try to push for governor the next time, something like that. You, you got to be a little sneaky with it because you can't always outmuscle people in that arena. And sometimes people just have so many votes, you don't have any chance to really get uh, the political offices that you want. Because you're ECAS and they know you want them, they're going to stop you. So your, your last option is hegemony. Just like anyone else, you love taking special regions and building the craft workshops out of the valuable trinkets to give yourself a constant tick of hegemony. That, that, you know, that green count next to the name, how much hedge you get each day. Really, really powerful in ECAS, just as it is on everybody else. But be aware of, you know, that Icarus syndrome, you know. If people start seeing you build craft workshops, it's going to put an even larger uh, target on your back. So oftentimes I will not build early craft workshops on ECAS because they're so good at getting their hedge in other ways. I sort of wait until I'm, I'm getting ready for that end game sprint. And then I build all my craft workshops at once because I know that if I build them, it's if you build it, they will come, right? If I build craft workshops and I'm already in a dangerous hedge position, I know the bad guys are coming. The, the you know the the special hedge work that you also need to be a, aware of is the the research center the hegemony that the research center gives you is retroactive based on your controlled and special regions um, 
So it's not retroactive on the likes of um, champion kills or, or spice contracts and things like that. It does count for spice contracts, so anytime you pay a spice contract while you have the research center up, we'll pay out an extra 15% more. That's why we like it early in the game. But if we get to a, we get to a danger close kind of situation where we've got too much hegemony and we look like we're threatening, let's rock up, let's take this village real quick. That'll put us up to 20k, boom, boom, boom. So we annex this village, we jump up to over 20k in hegemony, and we'll, our, you know, our little, uh, our notification will pop up telling everyone that we're getting close to hedge. Well, we don't want them to come kill us, so one thing we can always do is come back in here and we can cancel our, our, our research center. We can, you can right click on it and remove it. Let me show you real quick. So we jump up. Boom, we're at 21,000 hegemony. Oh no, we're so dangerous. We cancel our research center, we get rid of it. That knocks the 15% bonus off of the controlled regions that we have, right? Um, so now we're down to just 20,000, which is still you know, kind of dangerous, but maybe less dangerous. Maybe it makes our, our neighbors a little less nervous. In that case, we can stick in a land's headquarters there. I didn't talk about the middle. You can kind of stick whatever you want in the middle. Um, ideally, you would love a two blue in there. You can put a two red in there, but it'll make your economy a little light. Put whatever you want in the middle. It doesn't matter too much. Whatever you need to get keep keep the game going. Lands right quarters is a great pickup for the third one. Um, but then what we can do is we can keep sort of growing our hedge normally, and then once we get ready for the end game push, we can come back and we could rebuild our research center. And as soon as the research center is done, it's going to give us 15% more of all of our controlled region and special region bonuses. So it is a big boost to an immediate jump of your hegemony. So wait till you feel like you're at like 23 or 24 hedge, build your research center, Send your guys in your base back to your uh, your sanctuaries. Anything that's cheap enough, come in here. You can annex your sanctuaries. Those will instantly add their bonuses to your hedge. Send your hedge army out. Go stomp on some militia somewhere, and you can jump way up in hedge before other people can deal with it, right? Uh, that's the way to hedge. That is the way to ECAS. Oh, I'm sure we forgot some. Oh, armor. We didn't talk armor. Let's talk armor real quick. Squires, on squires we like um, frontline tactics to get a little extra armor to guys that are nearby to them because we don't care about their power all that much. And we also, we like the prickly spear. Oh no we don't. We like the sobering medication. Uh, sobering medication says 50% of the damage bonuses are turned to damage reduction. You're going to have plus 50% damage thanks to your... Um, your big flagship and your war banners. So you take this and it gives you 25% damage reduction, making your squires even insanely tanky or super hard to kill. We love it. Musketeers, we like the barrel cleaner for the first attack doing 100% more damage because they already have a high power. And we like the heavy loads for extra power. Um, of special note though, shadow scan is amazing. Can detect units at long, stealth units at long range. So if you are getting assassinated, if you are dealing with a troublesome Fremen army that can sneak through the shadows, um, grab the shadow scan and long range is really, really long. Um, stick some musketeers in any villages you think assassins might be coming to and they will blow the assassins away before they get there. Shadow scan, super cool. You know, not the not the, the straight up shooting guys in the face and killing them tech, but allowing to see stealth at long range is a very unique ECAS bonus as well. A lot of factions can't do that kind of thing. Fencers we don't like, never never take them. War banners we do like, and we stick distracting lights on them to reduce uh, um, or enemy units targeting this unit receive extra damage. That's fine, We'd, so they they're incentivized not to focus fire our war banners. And we really like marching colors, extra speed outside of combat, speed up this death ball army. Um, it's great because it keeps you from getting eaten by worms, mostly. Knights don't have great options, but we like the vow of heroism. Plus three command points hurts. It's pretty painful. I think you could probably try not to use this, although the other ones aren't very good. But plus 15 power is amazing, and it synergizes nicely with our bonus to our percentage of power and with our heroic quest as well. So that's why we take the Vow of Heroism. And then the last one we like is, is probably just the Vow of Honor to buff up our squires at short range just a little bit. Mostly because we don't want to lose the health from fervor, and we don't want to lose the extra armor from bravery. Knights are already, you know, sort of dangerously squishy at, at bad times, so we don't want to make them extra squishy if we could avoid it. 
that's our armory, that's our tech, that's our faction. I'm sure I forgot stuff. Um, feel free to ask questions down below. I've played a lot of ECAS. I've played a lot of ECAS in tournaments. I've played a lot of high-end, high-skill matches with them, and they are one of the very best. They are a ton of fun to play. Hopefully that's helpful to you guys. Like I said, shout out down below if you've got more questions, and um, we'll do some more guides like this in the future. Thanks for watching, and uh, I'll talk to you later. See you guys.